Today, I wanna to take you through how we're using large language models in a software as a service platform that I recently launched called LearnTail. We had to make some design decisions that I wanna cover and we're also running into some issues and I'm actually really curious to hear your thoughts about it. Now with LearnTail, you can create quizzes from anything, including texts, websites, and even YouTube videos. The idea of this platform is that it's a way for you to learn more actively. Instead of just watching a YouTube video or reading a blog post, you can immediately train your knowledge by doing a quiz about it. If you wanna try this out yourself, it's free. Go to LearnTail.com. I've also put a link to a quiz on LearnTail below most of my videos. If you go to the description, you can simply click there and do a quiz about the topic of the video. You don't need to register or anything, it's just something that I wanna to give to you to help you learn better. Now, before I dive into the code, there's one more thing I wanna get off my chest. You know, I've seen so many videos or blog posts of people talking about how easy it is to launch a platform like this. Well, from my experience, Launching a software as a service platform is really hard. People just underestimate how much work goes into the mundane things like being able to register and log in and delete your account, having a paid subscription, billing and accounting, international tax compliance, privacy policies and terms and conditions, security measures, making sure you don't pay through the nose on cloud hosting costs, and the list goes on and on. I wanna avoid you falling into the trap of thinking this is easy. So. What I'm going to do in the coming months is post videos about what we learn while we're developing and improving the platform. I won't share the full source code with you, it's just way too much and I still want to turn this into a commercial product so we need to keep some secrets, right? But I'm going to more or less develop this platform out in the open and I'll share everything that goes wrong, things we had to do to fix the problems, steps we took to gradually improve and scale the service. And my goal with this is to make sure that you have a realistic view of what's actually involved in building a product like this. And at the same time, provide you with a sort of blueprint of how you can do it yourself. So I've created a new playlist where I'll group videos I do about LearnTail. So you can watch them all together or completely ignore them if you don't like me doing this kind of stuff. Now, don't worry. I'm not going to turn Iron Codes into a LearnTail only channel or something like that. I'll still mostly post content on Python, software design and architecture and any other new cool stuff that I think is exciting in the software industry. Now, I've talked a lot, so let's take a closer look at how LearnTail uses large language models. So the way we generate quizzes in this system is that you can either enter a text or a description, you can enter a URL, that also includes a YouTube URL. So in the code itself, we need to do some work in order to extract data from those URLs before we can actually create a quiz about them. At the moment, the way this works is actually pretty rough. So we're using beautiful soup to uh, retrieve text from a URL. So we're using the requests package to get the URL data and then provide that to beautiful soup that parses the HTML. Then we simply get the body tag and then use the get text method from that uh, body tag, and strip it and then return it. And that's basically it. So it's a pretty stupid way of doing it. And this definitely leads to problems. For example, we had some cases where the quiz was actually generated about the cookie statement instead of the actual text on the website. And of course the body of the HTML contains way too, many, way too much information. So we're currently investigating mechanisms of doing this smart. One way we could do this is by simply trying to come up ourselves with a couple of simple mechanisms to clean up the data from the body tag. Another thing that we're thinking about is actually sending this to GPT and then asking it to clean up the data and provide a coherent text based on the HTML data. And then we can even look into the fine tuning mechanisms that uh, OpenAI recently opened up. So that could be an interesting path. The only problem with that is that it's going to increase the response time of generating a quiz. And I'm not sure we really want to do that because having a system that's fast is also nice. What do you think is the better method? Should we go for letting GPT analyze it and having a larger response time? Or should we try to come up with something semi-smart ourselves that's going to be a bit faster? So that's about getting text from a URL. For YouTube videos, we do this slightly differently because of course the page itself doesn't contain much information, if any at all. So what we're doing there is that we're using a library called YouTube Transcript API that allows us to get the transcript of a video and then use that as the basis for the quiz. The problem is that this uses a undocumented 
documents a feature of the YouTube API. So it's completely unclear. Google can basically decide to switch off this feature and then we won't be able to do this anymore. And there's other options such as rate limits and other limitations that we have to work around. So this has been quite a challenge. One thing that we are currently working on is adding a fallback mechanism so that getting the transcript, if that doesn't work, for example, because of some YouTube shenanigans or because uh, there is maybe no transcript, there, is video, there are definitely videos where there's no transcript available. Uh, if it's not there, then well, we can't use that to build a quiz around it. But of course, what we could do in that case is try to at least build a quiz based on the title and description. And those things you can get from every video using the YouTube Data API. By the way, if you're enjoying these videos where I share a bit more about how we set up the whole system, you might also be interested in my upcoming software architecture course. I'm going to launch the course this year. You can pre-register for this course for free. Just go to iron.code slash architect to learn more. I've also put the link in the description of the video. So how do we then actually create the quiz? So for that, we're using Langchain and Langchain has an integration with OpenAI's chat model. We're also using the Pydantic output parser. So this allows us to define an object. For example, here we have the quiz object. So that has a slug, a source, we store the keywords. Uh, quizzes are created by user, so there's user ID and a couple of other things as well. And then the quiz itself has questions, which are the actual questions in the quiz. So what do we need to do to then actually create these quizzes? Well, one thing we learn is that if you integrate your application with an AI, like OpenAI's uh, GPT model, that it's kind of finicky. There's all kinds of limitations that you have to work around. Uh, for example, the most important one is the number of tokens. So GPT 3.5, for example, does have a 16K token model, which we switched to. We used a 4K token before. And for GPT 4, you even have a 32K token limit. So that's pretty large, but it's still possible that if you have a large web page or a very long YouTube video that you actually surpass these limits and your system needs to be able to handle that. So we've built a simple chunking system that takes long text and chunks them into several parts that we can then concurrently send to the OpenAI API. And then when all that data gets back, we combine that into a single quiz. But there's other things you have to take care of as well. We noticed that the API sometimes doesn't respond. So then you have to retry it a couple of times or in some cases, we're actually not getting valid JSON data back, even if we told the AI explicitly in the prompt to provide us with a JSON response. Or perhaps you still reach the token limit when the AI generates the quiz, because the problem is that those 16K tokens for GPT 3.5 or the 32K for GPT 4 includes both the input and the response from the AI model. So that means that it's very hard to predict what the actual limit is of how much text we can send to the API so that we take into account that there's enough room left in the token space to actually create the quiz. Because if the quiz is not complete, then we get an incomplete JSON object that we can't parse and we can simply not use the result. And there I really see a key difference between integrating with traditional APIs, just sending a request and getting a response versus integrating with an AI. API. With the AI API, there's just more things to go wrong. And um, part of that has to do with, I guess, the current popularity of these AI models, and that leads to some scaling issues. But part of it also has to do with the AI being unpredictable in some cases. And that's just extra stuff that you have to deal with in your application. The final thing that I want to show you is that we have our prompts. So here I have actually a shortened version of that prompt. So we simply ask it to create a multiple choice quiz and we provide it with these templated values that you can then change in the settings. What we're currently struggling with is getting the AI to produce higher quality quizzes. And what we've realized is that the AI doesn't know the difference between an easy, medium and hard quiz. So we're going to have to adapt the prompt to supply that information and basically teach the AI what is an easy quiz, what's a medium level quiz, and what's a hard quiz, and how do you actually create those? Uh, so we're currently doing some experiments with that. Another thing is that if you look at some of the quizzes that have been generated by the tool, that typically the longest answer is always the correct one. So that makes them, of course, way too easy. So we have to instruct the AI somehow that it should generate answers that are approximately the same length. But by simply writing that in a prompt, 
it doesn't work that well. It doesn't really give those results back. Now, that's with GPT 3.5. Perhaps with GPT 4, it does a better job. We were still looking into that. But we spent a fair bit of time experimenting with different prompts and different ways of asking for the information and checking what works and what doesn't. So that's another thing that we learned from this is that if you build a tool that integrates AI, you don't just write tests for your for the code that you're actually writing. You also need to have a testing methodology in place for testing how well the API works with sp specific types of prompts. And that's pretty hard to test because of course the AI doesn't respond in the same way every time uh, and we like some randomness. I think what could be really cool, I don't think that exists at the moment, is to create a prompt testing library. Sort of like Hypothesis, which does property-based testing, but then it would generate prompts, maybe even using AI, uh, gets the response and verifies that it actually uh, corresponds to what you expect of the prompt. And then it can vary those things and, uh, and test it automatically. I think something like that would be really cool to have, it would be definitely be useful to us. Uh, if we have some time, maybe we'll uh, set up something like that ourselves and uh, publish it as an open source software. So there's lots of things we've learned so far from using these large language models in our backend. And there's lots of questions we still have that we don't have an answer to at the moment. We're trying to figure out what the best path forward is. And of course, when we learn from it, I'm going to share this in more videos with you. If you have any suggestions, post them in the comments. I'd love to hear. I hope you enjoyed this deeper dive into how we integrated an LLM in our backend. So like I said, we use Langchain for this. If you want to learn more about how Langchain actually works, how it's been designed, and what are some of the possibilities with Langchain, I did a full video about that. You can watch that right here. Thanks for watching and see you next week.